There we go. Let's see, we got a few participants in here already. Good morning from Seattle. We're going to get started in just one second. Once our stream gets off and rolling, we'll be we got a ton to cover today, so we're going to start in just a moment. Morning, Nancy. Good morning, everybody else uh, across the world. I was checking the chat to make sure that everything went off. It was Nancy Merlin. Hey, Nancy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Colin O'Keefe. I am joining you here from Seattle, Washington. Uh, joining me uh, as well on this webinar, my usual co-host on these things, is Michelle Nublom, our editor. Michelle's joining us from, if I have this right, Budapest, Hungary. How's it going this morning uh, across the Atlantic? Yeah, no, it's going great. Yes, joining you from Hungary. <laughs> a little bit different from Seattle, but. <laughs> yeah, probably a lot nicer. We got our fog, we got our typical Pacific Northwest weather out behind us. Uh, and we've got a lot to cover today, as I alluded to there for a second. So much stuff to talk about. So we're going to dive right in. Uh, I will say off the bat, if you have any questions, you want to chime in with anything, hellos are always nice too. Uh, don't hesitate to drop that in the chat window. We'll try to hit those as we go. Uh, we also will, fingers crossed, have a little bit of time at the end for questions as well. We can always stay late to answer those uh, if people have them as well. Um, as we dive in, some quick housekeeping, of course, welcome back. Uh, we're really finding our groove with these monthly webinars. We'll have another one next month. We don't have the date locked in quite yet, but as far as subject goes, I think we're going to have a good one. We all have, I think we're going to have a special guest uh, who's going to put together a great session for all of us. Uh, a couple of resources that are worth checking out. The LexBlog.com Resource Center has a ton of uh, valuable uh, post articles, what have you, on kind of the fundamentals of blogging. And that's going to be something that we focus on a lot in 2022 as well, uh, is building that out. Uh, this week in the Go Blogging, Michelle's running the show over there. It's our outstanding podcast. Get it wherever you get your podcast. Uh, Spotify, Apple, what have you. Uh, we haven't pulled a Neil Young and gotten it off there yet, but we'll play it by ear, I suppose. Uh, and then lastly, 99 Park Row, it's the Lex Blog team blog, just 99parkrow.com. Keep an eye on kind of our observations in digital publishing, uh, and then also what we're working on. We like to share what we're working on over there as well. Um, and lastly, if you want a presentation like this, or you want to talk blogging strategy, or you know, maybe review some of your firm's content or talk to us, even just your marketing team about some of the things that we talked about here today. Don't hesitate to reach out. We got you, especially if you're a Lexblog client. Uh, we'll put something like this together for you, whatever you're looking for. Uh, hey, that's part of working with us. Uh, here's what we got on deck for today's session. Like I mentioned, so much to cover today. Uh, we're going to get into the biggest law blog topics of 2021, who covered them well in our community, uh, some big stories heading into 2022, the hot stop, a few hot topics we started blog on in the new year, just a couple uh, examples and where we kind of recommend uh, taking a look at a few other things, a few broader trends in digital publishing that we expect to see hit legal, and then also what Lexblog is working on in 2022. And like I mentioned, if I'm racing through this, it's I, we got like 40 slides. So we're gonna try to get everything in here and cover it all. I've couched that enough. So without further ado, let's get kind of off and rolling and take a look back at uh, 2021 in the LexBlog community. Uh, first and foremost, if you're on here, there's a good chance that you're in the LexBlog community. So you know, a round of applause to you. More than 62,000 posts uh, from the LexBlog community in 2021, which is just 
astounding how many we have. We added 298 new blogs to our community. Uh, if your blog's not in the LexBlog community, it's free. Have us uh, join it. We syndicate your content out for free. Uh, it's very straightforward. If you have any questions, reach out to us. But otherwise, head over to LexBlog.com. Up in the top right, there should be something that says uh, join there, and you can join, join the ranks. Uh, similarly, we added 4,525 new authors from those blogs. So uh, the momentum just continues. These numbers are staggering just how much lawyers just keep on publishing. There's so much that's going on out there. Uh, here's a little peek at uh, how kind of the progression, the, the rhythm and the flow to the posts that were coming out across our community. Uh, in March, similar to last year, we saw a big bump in March. I think this time it was probably a little bit more to do with uh, kind of the anniversary of COVID, a lot of posts around that. I think this chart probably also to a certain extent looks like one's workout routine as they head into the new year. So I think you see a little bit more in January, Mar February and March before it levels off a little bit into a usual groove. Um, I think I think we all feel uh, in the law, December is a little bit slower than other months. Uh, and that was definitely the case here. Uh, but not otherwise still held steady. I mean, an average of 5,224 posts a month across our community, 174 posts every day. Uh, it's really staggering uh, the amount of content that we have flowing out and across the community. I mean, uh, Michelle, this is your second year doing, you know, second year serving as editor. I mean, what's your view? I'm putting you on the spot here. My apologies. I know it's not a favorite thing, but I mean, what was your view one year to the next? It seems like it was I think last year was the craziest because we were all dealing with the pandemic. And this year, it's, you know, I think it's kind of how life's been where it's, it's still a little different, but trying to find our ranks and I don't see how it's going. But yeah, what's your take on it? Yeah, no, I mean, I think last year, like seeing just, yeah, the staggering amount of posts, it was kind of that question of like, is this going to continue into the new year? Is it going to kind of like level out? But even like aside from COVID related topics, we just had so much blogging and so much, like so many great insights coming in. So that's always really reassuring and exciting to see. Yep. Uh, on this, here's a, a look at, so we basically drop all the blogs into categories and take a look at what blogs were producing the most. Uh, as is usually the case, employment law really dominates. Um, it's always the most popular. We saw a lot of growth in uh, international law as well. You can see that uh, really expand. And something to keep in mind is, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I don't want to start a criminal blog or a privacy blog or something, start something even narrower niche within that, uh, oh, you're thinking, oh, this isn't the space to do it because that's obviously not where people are. Well, fewer posts or fewer blogs means, you know, less competition that you have to go up against. So there might be a little bit more uh, elbow room in that conversation. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're like, oh, this is so crowded. Do we want to do this? Do we want to do that? Uh, keep that in mind. And then another thing, uh, you know, if you're going to start an employment blog, and we'll have an idea for employment blog later, is to narrow it down because the competition is going to be so steep. But hey, why does employment law dominate? Why is it such a popular law blog subject? Well, every single business out there needs employment law, has employment and HR issues that they have to talk about. Um, and then also it's just, yeah, it's super relatable. It's understandable. You're dealing with issues a lot of people run into. And then of course, of course, of course, I think I think the pandemic probably impacted employment and labor law as much as any individual area of law, which is why you saw such a, a massive amount of posts in that area. It's not out of the norm, but I'm sure that only fueled uh, the their first place finish there. Uh, and then now we'll take a quick look at some of the popular subjects covered by our community. As you can see, COVID, coronavirus, absolutely the tops. Uh, just dominated a lot of the conversation this year. More than 11,000 posts mentioned COVID or coronavirus, uh, just really staggering stuff. Uh, so basically one sixth or one fifth of all posts published by the LexBlog community this year mentioned that. So, and then that probably does include posts that were, you know, offhanded mention it or something like that, but still um, even that 11,000 number, one sixth feels low as crazy as that is. Um, 
Also, you can see Biden on there, Trump on there. Uh, you see OSHA, probably NLRB is mixed in there as one of the big terms. Uh, a change in president or change in administration is always going to be key in the legal space, especially in today's political climate, where you see, uh, to some extent, a lot of rubber banding to a certain extent where, you know, the a Biden uh, EPA or OSHA or NLRB is going to behave worlds differently than a, a Trump NLRB or EPA or something like that. Uh, so you're bound to see that. And then, of course, a uh, big year for SCOTUS news. You have... Uh, kind of the, 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 I think we saw a great example of it in the last few months, which is kind of the Biden presidency going up against what's been a, a Trump Supreme Court for the most part. You saw that with the vaccine mandate for large employers. So you're going to see a lot of Supreme Court news. And then, of course, heading into uh, 2022, there's going to be a lot of big cases decided. And you're going to see a lot more of this where potentially more Trump policies or, or more Biden policies are put to the test, but then you also have stuff like Roe v. Wade and stuff like that as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see, particularly, and then we're going to have to, on top of this, this isn't something that necessarily our network is all over, but it'll be interesting to watch uh, with the Supreme Court, again, changing, not necessarily as big as it did last time, but to see who the new justice is, uh, what their makeup is, and then eventually, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, if they can get this through what how they perform in a, uh, a new year. So we'll see how that progresses. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over here to Michelle, uh, our editor, who's always keeping an eye on what's flowing across the network and take a look at some of the big stories of 2021 and who covered them well. Just a few sample posts on some of the biggest stories of the year. Uh, here you go, Michelle. Yeah, so I mean, I could talk forever about <laughs> how many great posts we had this year. So I won't do that. I'll keep it short. But I mean, in regards to policies and legislation enacted by the Biden administration, obviously with a new president administration in 2021, there was plenty to kick off the year talking about in terms of predictions, what to expect. But one really standout piece to me in this area came from Harris Brickens Akshat Devetia on the HB blog. Though it was penned at the end of 2021, I think that this one especially was a really exceptional piece because he had actually written out some predictions for Biden in the admin immigration sector at the end of 2020. He like links to that at the beginning of his post, you can see there. And because he did that so well, he was then able to reflect back on what passed, what wasn't accomplished, and suggest even further what to expect in the second year of Biden's presidency. So, you know, with the appointment of a new DHS, the signing of three executive orders right out the gate, he did conclude in his post that the progress was there, even if it was a little slow, but I would totally recommend no matter what sector you're in, no matter what practice area you do um, at the end of each year or starting in early January, it's not too late to do this now. Just, you know, blogging about some predictions relevant to your sector. It gives you a great opportunity at the end of the year to reflect on it. You can see what you got right, what you got wrong, but it's really, I think, a valuable insight to any of your audience, any of your readership to see that kind of stuff. So just a great piece all around here in that category. And then uh, the next thing, obviously, we kind of, you know, just came up on the one year anniversary of this pretty historical, not really seen before in recent time event. <laughs> so while quite a few members of our community, you know, took to blogging on this when it first occurred, I would say that not many did so more candidly than Scott Greenfield on his blog, Simple Justice. If you're a reader of his blog, if you followed it for a while, you'll know that he covers things in a very fiery, honest voice, and this piece was definitely no exception. Uh, he published his thoughts just one day after the event, so very fresh. And I mean, if you scroll down, you can see that 91 people engaged with him in his comment section. And that just really goes to show that being honest and not always attempting to fit that cookie cutter mold of how you should behave as a blogger or as a lawyer can really pay off. And if something this big happens and you feel comfortable doing so, it's very fair that Obviously not everyone is going to feel as comfortable like being vulnerable to share their insights like this. But if you do like jump on it because your audience reads your writings for a reason and odds are they're gonna be interested in your perspectives on just huge nationwide topics like this one. So yeah, I think that this post especially just really goes to show just the vast array of subjects that you can hit on on your blog. Like even if you have a niche blog, you're not always like um, restricted to like that. So like if something big happens, you can definitely give your take on it. And this is a great example of just how to do that. 
Yep. And I mean, blogging is really all about building trust with folks and having them get an opportunity to get to know you and how you process things, what you think of things and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And understandably in the political space, it can be a little dicey, but at the same time, as Nancy mentioned, this is, this is Scott's brand uh, for, I don't want to say for better or worse, but it's, it's, he's fiery. Everybody knows he's fiery yes. in the blogging <laughs> space. And that's why we all know he's fiery. I love anybody who's out in the legal blogging sphere has got a sense for him. And yeah, he'll, he'll put his views out there. And that's, kind of what it's all about. And I mean, honestly, as a one little side effect of stuff like this that I think is interesting is he'll always remember or at least be able to see what he thought the day of or day after this. So if it's, you know, 2036, mm-hmm. he'll be able to take a look back and, oh yeah, here's what I wrote about that. That was a crazy day. Onward. Yeah. So for um, the next topic, I mean, I think it's kind of no surprise here that Dan Schwartz was interviewed for uh, on the news for vaccine mandates and COVID questions. Again, if you're someone who's familiar with his blog, you'll know that he is just always on top of these issues. And just like being honest, I could have picked a number of pieces regarding COVID vaccines of his to highlight as great coverage of that and the continued conversation around COVID. But I think this one was worth mentioning just for a few reason, few reasons. One, you know, it's a great example of how just being that consistently good blogger can build that reputation for you where you're being asked to field questions on a topic as important as this one. Like he is obviously, he wasn't just randomly asked, like, what are your thoughts like on COVID and vaccine mandates? Like he got that reputation for a reason. And a big part of that was through blogging. And I think too, that this is just a great example of how you can repurpose other mediums you appear in, you produce into blog posts because he does this very easily. And even at the end of it, he adds some additional insights onto the end that like weren't mentioned in the interview that he conducted, but just overall, it's another really easy to read understandable post as most of Dan Schwartz's are. He's a big proponent of those Q and A posts. And for a good reason, because they are obviously very big hits with the target audience. They're understandable. Like you can see there, it's just a really clear post. You could just scroll through, see which question you're kind of looking for the answer to. And yeah, and he links to his appearance on the news at the beginning, if you're ever interested in hearing more. But yeah, Dan Schwartz is definitely one of those bloggers we have in our community who is always at the top of the employment and labor law section. Always nice when you can be like, hey, I was on the news. And I mean, if you get the type of media, (laughs) extend the reach of it, extend the usefulness of it. You put in the time, you earned it. I mean, take the opportunity to spread that around a little bit more, those media hits, as opposed to firing off an alert that simply says, Dan Schwartz appeared on the news, which I, not that there's anything wrong with that, but take it a a step further. If somebody appears someplace, extend the reach of that, bring it back to your home base. That is the blog. Yes, definitely. Yes. So the the next topic, um, the Reddit users come together to buy GameStop stocks. So I would say like, at least for me, the whole GameStop stock event may seem either like it happened yesterday or years ago, depending just on how your perception of time has been warped (laughs) during these past couple of years of COVID. But it was definitely one really noteworthy moment that I think kicked off the year. And we had many blog posts coming in that did like a really great job. Like we had a lot that were explaining exactly what was going on for, you know, the general public who isn't as well-versed in the stock market. I'm definitely referring to me here, (laughs) but I really appreciated this piece from Julie St. John because she, I would say like perfectly executed how you bring a large event back into your specific niche. Cause if you see, like she started off by giving a rundown of what happened with GameStop, just to give some context. And just one quote that I wrote down that I want to share. Cause I think it just illustrates just a perfectly smooth transition is uh, what happened with GameStop illustrates the power individuals can have when they work together. In this case, it was individual investors in the stock market. However, this principle also applies to workers. It is the same principle unions have stood behind in the workplace for decades. One worker standing up alone has very little power over an employer, but when workers stand together, their collective power to make change is much greater. So like, I think that's just an awesome take. That's just a very, it just looks like easy. It just looks effortless how she was able to bring this event and like really apply it to her sector and just make that transition into like, hey, this piece of news is really interesting and kind of like not unprecedented, but this doesn't happen a lot, but you know how it came about because a lot of people were working together and how else people can do that union. So I just really, really loved that piece from her. And that was one that I think just 
even like did a great job covering this big event. But overall, I think from the entire year, it's definitely a noteworthy piece to look to as an example of how to yeah apply those broader subject areas to your specific niche. And I mean, we say this all the time. If you want people to read what you write, you got to write stuff that people want to read. So write on something interesting, get involved in the national conversation and people are more likely to uh, read the individual piece and also subscribe to your blog and be a consistent reader as well. Mm -hmm. Now into 2022, what do we got lined up? What are we keeping an eye on? What is, you know, so all the lawyers have started taking a peek ahead. Uh, Grinnell's joining us here, taking a look as well at the big stories 2022, but what do we got on deck? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, already we have had a lot of just, I would say, 10 out of 10 blog posts, you know, recapping the biggest legal stories from the year. But like already into the new year, we've seen a lot of different bloggers in different areas jump on the opportunity to really inform their readership of what is going to be definitely of note into the year ahead. So one of those would be, you know, the implications of Biden's Build Back Better plan if it passes. Obviously, this is going to be a constantly evolving topic as we see what happens there. And one that is for sure going to, we're going to see plenty more blog posts produced around it. But the smartest thing you can do, and this is very similar to what I was just talking about with the GameStop stop, um, Game, GameStop stock <laughs> events, um, is taking yeah a major nationwide subject like this, exactly what John Milikowski does here on his blog, taking that talked about topic, whatever it may be, and just getting in that mindset really of how can you bring this back to your niche? How can you best educate your audience with this? In his case, it was by writing about how the plan is going to affect business owners. And yeah, like any sort of nationwide federal legislation similar to this, whether it's passed, whether it looks like it's going to, even if it might not, but there's a chance it could, how is that going to affect your readers? Like, just let them know. People are really, really going to appreciate that. It's like, I'd say definitely more rare for a Google search to like produce a reputable news article because those are going to apply to like, what's in the bill? Like, how is this going to affect everyone? I think bloggers really can take that opportunity to say, this is how it will directly affect you. And yeah, again, just a great example of how to do that. <laughs> I think you're on mute, Colin. Uh, I was gonna, I, I didn't have this as one of the blog ideas, but if Build Back Better goes into effect, you could probably start a whole blog around it based on how, I guess we'll see how big it's going to be if it gets through. Uh, but if it's as big as, you know, certain uh, half of Congress would like it to be, uh, the amount of infrastructure work there is, the amount of uh, tax implications, business implications, it'll be interesting to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. There we go. And yeah, just a couple more left in terms of like the big stories to hit on. But again, it's a big, important year, a big year to come. There's a lot to talk about. But as a blogger too, you know, you should always be listening. There are many ways to do that, whichever you feel comfortable using a news aggregator, following, you know, thought leaders on Twitter, or just watching the news day or night. And if someone says something that you have a thought on, like just enter that conversation. That's exactly what John Hyman did here. Uh, I think this is another really candid, honest piece that looks at what the conversation currently is. And, you know, he interjects like what it should be including, like for in this case, the labor unions are winning and their popularity is growing. And that's kind of a conversation he saw happening, but it was kind of uh, not lending credit to the fact that maybe the unions are succeeding. So he was like, hey, like people should know this. And this is definitely something you can do as an individual blogger, you know, like you have that chance as we were talking earlier with Scott Greenfield, if you feel comfortable to just really like voice your opinion, just be like honest and not just another example of how not every blog post needs to be some breaking news format. His piece is relatively short when it comes to blogging, but it's very to the point. It makes some great predictions too for what to expect in labor activism as we move forward. But yeah, I think if you ever hear, especially someone on the news, some noteworthy person saying something and it's in your field of expertise and you're like, hey, you're not painting the full picture. Like let people know, like we need people to do that. So that's what he does here. Michelle was asking me this, is it the coronavirus law blog or the Empire <laughs> Lawyer law blog? I think I saw him on LinkedIn say, well, no, when the pandemic is actually winding down when I'm able to change this temporary masthead back from coronavirus law blog. But yeah, I mean, it's a good example. Another thing we talk about all the time, if you're consuming media, you know, in your personal life and you're taking a look around and it's something that makes you think of 
your blog or your area of practice, make a post into it. Obviously, this one's really on the nose when it's talking explicitly about John's area of law. But at the same time, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff where it might not be ex as explicit that you can still bring back to your blog and turn into an interesting post. Mm -hmm. Okay, last one in terms of big stories for 2022 and maybe not the most optimistic, but <laughs> without first um, diving into the context of this piece, I do just wanna start out by saying that this type of sort of recap of your area of law or look ahead to what's to come is definitely going to be appreciated by your readership. And like, if you look at this piece, for example, it's a very huge comprehensive post and I could go on and on about it, but I won't. <laughs> so just focusing on one of these top 10 stories that Kevin LaCroix notes from the year, I think it's the yeah pa pandemic related effects roiling the economy, threatening further litigation. He does a really nice job detailing, you know, some foreseeable threats to the economy, especially in response to COVID. The big ones are supply chain disruption, labor shortages, and the economic inflation are all expected in the months ahead, he says. So this, again, another piece where reflect on what happened, look forward to what you could predict. Your audience is always going to appreciate that because news outlets are definitely like where a lot of people get their news and they're not as commonly going to be hitting on this type of stuff so specifically as you can as a niche blogger so yeah hats off to this piece as well absolutely and we mentioned this on the easy post ideas webinar and by the way uh go to 99 park search webinar you'll be able to find all the recordings these types of posts are great to turn in uh, to a bunch of different stuff. You can turn it into something you can have a designer design up and send around in a PDF or print it out and mail it. Uh, you could put together a webinar. Like, I mean, we, this webinar is a result of our 2021 and 2022 look ahead. So you can take a post like this, turn it into a webinar. Uh, it's really a great, great way to do things and really extend the life of things. And yeah, I mean, you can, it, it, don't, don't just use it in, in one capacity, basically. Um, and now let's take a look at what folks are working on in 2022. We've got a big year ahead, uh, so much stuff. And I was really curious. So basically heading into this as part of our report, we asked people, what are you working on? What are you worried about? What predictions do you have? We got a couple interesting quotes. We ran a couple polls, but let's take a look uh, off the bat at what some people said. Um, William McCorkle at Bradley says, I'd like to see our underperforming blogs, their editors, and the blog's authors, authors produce more content and maximize the value of the firm's investment in blogging. This is always the number one uh, priority issue challenge that law firms have, which is getting lawyers to set aside the time to be able to do this. Um, we always talk about how blogging is all about how can you make it as easy on people as possible. We have some ideas around that, though I will say, Hey, if you've had something that has worked well for you, you know, if it's a quick prompt or something that you've seen has worked to get lawyers going, uh, drop it in the chat uh, and we'll share it with other folks and maybe get a couple interesting ideas. Uh, but yeah, don't hesitate to drop those in there. We can gather those out, share those out there and keep them secret if you want to, but uh, we're kind of all on the same team here. Um, but that's one thing that somebody's kind of take a work on is just you got to get lawyers blogging. And that's something that we're always working on as well. Uh, next, I thought this was really interesting from a partner in a boutique size firm. I uh, wanted to stay anonymous. The good attorneys are always busy. The less busy attorneys need a disproportionate amount of marketing to get them work. Uh, they also appear less able to network and do social media effectively, but they are still important to the firm. This is a difficult balance as to how much to spend on those folks. This is a really, really, really interesting one, uh, I think. I, th I thought that was an interesting paradox, which is uh, the good attorneys are busy and they don't need the marketing and other these guys do. I mean, one thing that we saw one firm do is, and I'll, this will be the first of two times that I mentioned this blog, Ballard Spar and now their consumer finance monitor. They had an attorney who basically was like, hey, I don't, I don't love doing like the networking or even like some of the litigation stuff that we're doing. What I really like is about staying abreast of what's going on out there and writing. Um, her name is Barbara Michigan. She's at Ballard Spar. And she said, I just want to write. And she decided to become just an absolute powerhouse blogger for Ballard Spar's, what was then the CFPB monitor, uh, and really fueled the growth of that. So it'd be interesting if maybe you, you know, obviously you're paying people, they want their billable hours, they want that type of stuff, but 
I don't know, maybe it's something where you stick them in the mail room and you're like, hey, you got to run this blog as a starting point. It'll teach you the area of law in which we're operating. It'll teach you the ways that we network. Uh, we need you as a younger lawyer uh, to learn this area of law and to learn how to bring in business as a lawyer through blogging. Um, so it's maybe there's an opportunity there to put them to work on that type of stuff, uh, especially if they're the ones who need the marketing in the first place. It's, it's, it's interesting because you would think the, the partners, the main partners, the, the older attorneys are the ones who would struggle with blogging. What we hear actually a lot is that it tends to be associates because they're closer to law school and they're almost trying to do too much. They're trying to write in an academic way uh, and it ends up not working great. Uh, so yeah, that's an interesting idea, but I, I wonder if there's a, a, a way to say, hey, let's Let's have to just stick them on the blog. Let's get you knocking out maybe multiple posts a week. Let's learn this area of law. Teach us what's going on, what you're seeing. Uh, and then let's work to build up your network a little bit there as well. I thought we had one more. We did have one more that I must have gotten out of here. But somebody said, and I want to share this lesson, was uh, they were working to hire more people because more and we're looking to hire more people in their marketing department. It was a, uh, I believe a marketing person at a boutique size international firm. And they were looking to uh, grow their marketing team because they think in 2022, we're gonna see more and more law firms, marketing departments have people who are really specialized. Some people who work on live events, some people who work on social and digital, uh, some people who might work on blogging specifically, or some people might work on print collateral. Uh, and based on what I've seen in the space, particularly in the marketing world, you're definitely going to see more and more specialized roles. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what may happen or what, what may lead to that in the future, what may prompt that. But you're going to see more and more focus on, okay, we need somebody who's really good at social specific content. We don't need a marketing generalist who can also do social or a marketing generalist who can also do live events. We want somebody who can really crush podcasting, video, and graphic design, which is a lot, but there's a lot of people out there whose specialty is social media production. Uh, so I think that was exactly spot on, as you're going to see more and more firms hire people into really specialistic roles in their marketing departments. Uh, I've seen it in the, the sports world uh, as the Mariners grew out, their marketing team uh, was a part of that, and you we got a digital motion graphic person, a digital graphic designer. Uh, and it's not the same person. He does different graphic design than what the, the traditional people do because it's just a different style and it's a different thing that you're going for. And I think you're going to see that one of the things start to spread to the legal space. Here's a look, a couple of those questions that we asked folks in our survey. What do you want your firm to be better at in 2022? Podcasting leads the way, followed by video, followed by LinkedIn. I thought it was really interesting that Instagram leads Facebook and Twitter. I thought that was really interesting, uh, particularly put particularly in the legal space that people want to be better at Instagram or they're more focused on Instagram than Facebook and Twitter in 2022. Then again, maybe they, they thought they had a great Facebook and a great Twitter, but it does seem like Instagram is, I think it's the platform that the most amount of people feel okay about. Uh, a lot of people, Twitter is a little bit harder to access. Facebook's kind of a mess. Um, so we'll, I, and then I think Instagram people have kind of settled in. That's my personal network. Some people even get some of their news. I see some of my stuff on there. I, it's, it's kind of the ecosystem. I was reading an article last night that was, hey, here are the top food pop-ups in Seattle. And the way that you follow these people are on Instagram and see what they're serving up as Instagram. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. And then we asked, of course, are you looking to invest blank time in digital publishing in 2022, more or less or the same? Uh, vast majority said more. Nobody said less. And some people said uh, the same. So you're going to see more and more people publishing in 2022. Uh, I think it'll be interesting as we round the corner on the pandemic, fingers crossed, hate, hate, knock on wood, fingers crossed, everything like that. So we'll see how that goes. I will say the one thing over here on, I, I've been meaning to write about this on TikTok because I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to be like, how do lawyers do well on TikTok? And 
it's very hard to define. If anybody's been on TikTok, you might see a TikTok person on their name overruled. And you kind of just have to be hilarious. You have to have something unique. I don't, I don't know what the overlap between like Amlaw 100 and 200 firms and TikTok would be. It's probably not a great fit, but some lawyers have succeeded and it's really like lightning in a bottle. So it's hard to replicate and say, if you do this, that, and the other, you'll succeed. But uh, maybe there's an opportunity. Yeah. Somebody mentions consumer facing lawyers are leading the way on TikTok. That's absolutely the case. They've almost been memeified. <laughs> It's funny because they'll be, and uh, I hate being the person who's like, have you seen these TikToks, which Michelle has heard enough about in our morning meetings, but uh, they'll be the person that's like, oh, my flight got canceled, but I know something that they don't know. And it's how you get a thousand dollars when your flight's canceled. But then people have like started memeing that I'm like, I know something they don't know. And then they like run away or something. I don't know. But yeah, consumer facing lawyers are definitely leading the way. Um yeah, my favorite lawyer on there is at Overruled, uh, just a really interesting dude. And he's a public defender, so it isn't like he's trying to bring in work. He's just putting his personality out there, uh, and it's really good. But yeah, I wouldn't say that lawyers need to dive in on TikTok or anything like that. It's just like catching lightning in a bottle. But it is interesting that podcasting and video are up top. And then there's a lot of overlap there, too, in that you can turn some podcasting into video, and you can probably turn some videos into podcasting, too. Uh, digital trends that could spread to legal in 2022. Some things that we're taking a look at uh, will probably potentially shape some of our product decisions uh, a little bit as well. Uh, but here are some of the things that, that we've seen kind of out in the world have started to migrate their way into the legal sphere. As we all know, not that it's anybody's fault, not that there's anything wrong with that. Legal tends to lag behind general digital publishing, which makes sense. Lawyers are a little bit more conservative, particularly when it comes to technology and putting themselves out there. Um, though, I mean, they kind of lead the way on blogging, which is very impressive. But here are some trends that could potentially spread to legal in 2022. Cautious is a good way to put it exactly. Very cautious. We're always on the, uh, keeping an eye out for risk. That's the whole point of the legal profession, or at least a lot of it. So exactly. Uh, one of the ones that I think is going to be worth keeping an eye on is the Substack style to blogging. Uh, I wrote a 99 Park post recently that explained that the reason that Substack has existed, and for those who don't know, uh, Substack is a community of writers who generate newsletters, and then they can charge people for their newsletters. Uh, it's been enormously successful for certain groups of writers. Uh, I wrote on 99 Park that the reason that it's been so successful is that it really emulates old school blogging. Uh, it does start with full text newsletters. So your posts go out full text into people's email inboxes, but that's really just the start of it. Uh, it relies heavily on bringing in kind of some existing bravado, bringing a, a brand and an audience with you. Really one of the key things is a very regular content schedule. So for a lot of these, it's every morning, you will get one of the sub stacks I subscribe to is every morning you get the biggest stories in baseball with a hefty dose of commentary. Uh, so that's interesting, but it's a very regular content schedule where readers know that they can expect a new piece of content or a new newsletter at a certain time. Uh, there's still a web-based blog for discoverability and sharing. Uh, on This Week in Legal blog Blogging, Bob Ambrosi spoke to David Latt, uh, formerly with Above the Law, now runs a Substack. There was a lot of stuff, of course, between those two things, but he even said Substack is really, it's just a blog. But another one of the big parts of it is the vast majority of Substacks, maybe even all of them, are single author. They're, they run like personal columns uh, as opposed to news sites. It's really, really has the feel of old school blogging, which that's, I mean, that's, that's why a lot of lawyers have succeeded. That's why like a Dan Schwartz or a Kevin LaCroix or John Hyman, some of the people we talked about earlier. Uh, that's why some of them have been so successful as they do some of the stuff that we mentioned here. And then I will say on the LexBlog product side, I'll, that we'll definitely be taking a look at full text newsletters uh, and seeing if we can do something like that and to see how receptive lawyers are to it. Uh, next, I think one of the things we're already starting to see, as you can see from this uh, DLA Piper tweet here, is you're gonna see much more refined social promotion. Uh, more quote graphics, more when you see a lot of law firms saying we want to get better at Instagram, you're going to see Instagram explainer galleries, stuff that you might see on uh, the Guardian's Instagram account where you swipe through and it kind of explains legal issues and stuff like that. Uh, 
you're going to see much more polished social promotion as opposed to just let's get this link out there or let's get up the same image we do in every single place. You're going to see more polished images that includes uh, open graph images. So when you share a story out on social, it looks nice. Uh, we'll probably take a look at whether or not we can get our platform to uh, basically automatically create some nice open graph images based on the title of posts and what's in there. We'll take a peek at that and see what we can do there. And then really building out a complete content ecosystem stemming from a blog or a publication. So you might have a podcast that goes off the blog, but you run your recaps off of the, the blog. You might have personal social feeds, but the blog is still the home base. You can run webinars off your blog, uh, live events, potentially, if we can ever have live events again. Um, but that'll, that'll be interesting to see, but you're gonna see more refined social promotion, I think coming off of blogs where kind of sets the standard that you have that level of polish. Uh, very, very closely related. Uh, we're starting to see more of this, uh, Stephanie Marone, if you're on this, I know Stephanie, you, you, you crush on this type of stuff as well. And I've been leading the way a lot on video lately. Um, you're gonna see more social and mobile specific video, uh, not, hey, here's six minutes or 12 minutes or 22 minutes explaining an area of the law. We're looking for under 60 seconds, um, at minimum under 90. They're posted directly to the social platforms in multiple spaces, uh, which is to say not YouTube, not anything like that. You take the MP4 and you upload it straight to the social platforms. Uh, and you're gonna see more square or tall video. What's the reason for that? Why are we seeing the square or tall video? It just takes up more real estate in somebody's newsfeed. It also fits better on the phone. Uh, this video, for example, over here from uh, Anthony Zoller's firm, uh, he's a great Zoller Law Group, great lawyer who does some awesome social promotion around his blog. Uh, this is a video and you can see it's captioned. Why are, why are you seeing all of this text all over videos today? The reason for it is most people are going to see video in their newsfeed and they're not going to turn on the sound. Um, you might be, you know, in the old days, you might have been on the bus or on the subway or something like that. Obviously, a little less common now, but even now, you mean, you might be watching a show with your significant other and you're scrolling away on your phone. You're not going to hit the sound button and, and disrupt everything. So it's, yeah, I can see it's new California laws for 2022 down at the bottom. It's closed caption. Uh, so yeah, you're going to see more and more stuff like that. Quick little teasers, quick little explainers that can also still drive people back to a home base or a piece of content that exists on a blog. Uh, next up, leading with top personalities. I mentioned this on, uh, uh, I mentioned this a little bit on the Substack thing where you see publications revolve around big personas. Uh, one project we worked on in its initial launch was Democracy Docket, uh, a blog, a massive site from lawyer Mark Elias, uh, big, big, big advocate for, for voting rights, uh, for expanding democracy. He's really led the way on that front. Rick Gibson Dunn's The Two Ted's podcast is another great example. Uh, two smart guys. I, I met Ted Olson before. He's an outstanding person to talk to really uh, getting uh, a chance to, you know, take the big time names and get them out there. And it's always nice if you can look for the rock star in your firm and you can provide kind of a low ask lift, kind of help lift others. So in the case of the two Ted's, it might be, hey guys, can we get you on, you know, sit down for 40 minutes at a time, maybe once a week, once every two weeks or what have you and talk about things. No, you don't have to worry about editing it. You don't have to worry about sharing it necessarily. We'll put everything together. We just want you to sit down and talk for 40 minutes on a regular basis. So that kind of low ask can help elevate the, the uh, prestige of your firm. It can elevate kind of the get, get kind of your leading personalities out there. You can say, hey, we have folks who have argued in front of the Supreme Court who have been part of some of this country's biggest cases. Let's put them out there. Let's get their views out there. Now we have a few blog ideas for 2022. Uh, only a couple, not saying you have to start these, but the, the idea with this, and you're going to get one of my personal favorites. I should probably, before we get into it, I'll say which one is mine before we get into the other ones and you'll see in a second. The reason that I highlight these is not to say start these exact blogs. It's to really highlight what you should be thinking about when you try to get in a new area. So with that in mind, what are we looking for? If you're thinking, hey, where should we start a blog? What should we do? What should we publish on? 
what are we looking for? A lot of people, a lot of firms fall into the trap of, we have this practice group, so we're going to start a blog for the practice group. That's how it works. It's just how simple it is. We're just going to, we got this practice group, we start a blog, and we'll try to make them publish as much as we can. Don't look at it just that way. Look for an obvious high growth sector. What is really going to take off in the coming year? And I honestly just thought of one I meant to include here that didn't, but I'll, I'll mention that here in a second. It's still very focused. Uh, you have the opportunity to write the book on a subject, looking at an area of law and saying, hey, wow, nobody's really, it's, it's a huge area in the news. There's a bunch of legal issues around it, but there's not anybody writing on it. There's not anybody known as the blank lawyer. So look for those issues. And then also it does of course help that there's legal issues from a variety of angles that it's not just, you know, family law, employment law or what have you. Cause then you could also potentially get lawyers from different practice groups involved and be known as the firm that really crushes this industry or this issue or anything like that. Um, and then also it always of course helps if there's plenty of news about it. So you're not just coming up with your own post ideas all the time. You're listening for what's going on and, and applying your legal perspective to it. So first up is the one that I should probably click before I say it's my favorite. Yeah, exactly. Make sure you'll see why in a second. Uh, first off, cannot be a bigger proponent of e-bikes in my life. I've ridden 5,000 miles on my e-bike. I love it. It's absolutely amazing. But that's not why it's in this presentation necessarily, though it did bias it to a certain extent. But if I were to start one blog, I don't know who you are, or who's out there, but if I were a lawyer and I was like, hey, I want to pick one subject and be known for it and write the book on it, like literally one thing, like, and if there are one area, I would pick e-bikes. And why? Uh, right now, electronic bikes, e-bikes are outselling electric cars globally, including in the United States, especially in Europe. So these things are selling like crazy. And they've absolutely been taking off after the pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of people are looking for a different way to get around, particularly with trips inside of like three to five miles. I'm not gonna give you the whole thing. Um, but the pandemic gave it a huge burst. And I think, I think people are going to be hesitant to go back to public transportation, at least in the short term. And then of course, uh, as well, we just don't know what the government's going to be able to get done, uh, on public transportation. Uh, you do have the opportunity. You could theoretically do all last mile transportation. You could include, uh, e-scooters. You could include, uh, those one wheels and stuff like that. But it's just so hard to define yourself as the multimodal guy or the last mile lawyer, uh, as opposed to just picking e-bikes and then also covering those other areas. Uh, there are so many different angles you could hit on this. You could hit uh, supply chain, intellectual property, regulation, uh, general growth in the space. You can hit safety issues. You can hit so many different things. And if you were known as the e-bike lawyer, there's no competition around this right now. I took a look out there to see if there was an e-bike law blog. There's not. So I don't know. If you're like thinking I'm crazy, this is absolutely insane, but you live in a city, the next time it's a sunny day in your city, take a look around at the bikes and just see how many of have a, a big thick battery on them. Uh, we're going to see these things take off. They've already started to, and there are legal issues abound because you're not a car, you're not a bike, you're not a pedestrian. Uh, there are just so many legal issues that could happen here. I think this is the one where people are going to go fall. No, nope, not yet. This one is Michelle's. Go ahead, go ahead Michelle. Yes. Uh, on remote work. Yeah, speaking of legal issues abound, <laughs> um, remote work, yeah. So obviously remote work, you know, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't really escalated in popularity until as recently as with COVID, where, you know, most people, most workplaces were ushered out of their office and for a lot of people, that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon, especially with how many benefits people have noticed with remote work, like how many positives there are. And again, like since this is kind of like a newer way to work, like it's not brand new, but it's new in popularity. Um, it's not going to be changing anytime soon. So again, if this, this would be a great blog to start because yeah, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> remote work is definitely here to stay with everything we've seen. So now is a great opportunity to just jump on that. And as we mentioned earlier, um, especially with like the influx of posts we see in the Lexblog community, labor and employment is our biggest, biggest category. So while you might not want to start just a general labor and employment blog, it's really smart to find a niche in that broader subject matter and just own it. And remote work is, I think, really just the perfect example of that. And I also 
you know, did some research and just Googled remote work law blog. And there are no apparent results right out of the gate, like maybe on like the third or fourth page of Google. I don't know. There's a lot of very popular articles about like the prevalence, the importance, the issues surrounding remote work. But I haven't found anyone who has decided to start that blog specifically on remote work. So right now is really just a great chance to make a name for yourself in the space. I'm honestly surprised that I didn't find one. That one didn't start last year or something when the, when COVID first started. But I mean, it can make sense because we didn't know how long the pandemic would happen. If like remote work wasn't a good idea, if people would shift back to in-person. But a lot of workforces are really adapting this either remote or hybrid model. And yeah, with it, there's a lot, a lot, a lot to cover their list. Yeah, you can cover just the different HR policies from working remote, taxation, trade secrets, side work and contracting, data security like there is just you will definitely not run out of <laughs> posts to pen on this topic. So yeah, especially with the landscape that is just evolving so con so constantly as this one, there's a lot to be done here. And someone just really needs to step up and own it. And like, I don't know, like Lexblog, we are remote workforce. If someone had in our community had a remote work blog blog I would definitely check into it every day aside from the fact that it's my job as editor but like that's just definitely just a really really interesting topic and I can see that appealing to a lot of people like even I could see in a few years you'll have like the the California remote work law blogger like the Texas remote work law blogger like just like that niche within a niche but yeah remote work definitely here to stay definitely a really great idea for anyone who's maybe like in the labor and employment area and just thinking of jumping on a subject area similar to this Absolutely. And obviously, nobody wants to be first. Nobody wants to be the first one out there. But there is an immense level of reward to being the first one out there. You can stake that, you know, put that stake in the ground and say, you know, we planted our flag. This is us. This is who we are. Uh, so there are risks, but there is reward as well. Speaking of risks, bear with me on this one. It might seem a little zany, but this one, somebody has planted the flag. So I would get on it soon if you want to. The psychedelics law blog. Uh, you are seeing increasing decriminalization around psychedelics, uh, particularly with regards to their study. Um, honestly, you're all you start to see. I've seen Instagram ads for like just random therapeutic stuff that revolve around this. So like any place where there's like this is similar to e-bikes in a certain extent, where if there's just a regulatory wild west, that is ripe for a lawyer to come in and help provide some guidance to what's going on in this space. Um, uh, similarly, I looked to see if the psychedelics law blog existed, and the the original people, Harris Brick and uh, uh, Hillary Brick, who crushed the can of law blog, they've already started to write psychedelics related content, taking a look at some of the things that we talked about, the studies that are taking a look, the decriminalization that's going a lot going on. I think you're going to see the the pharmaceutical world take a closer and closer look at what's going on in this space. I think we're still obviously really far away from it being where cannabis is today, but I think it's within the window of when Harris Gricken or somebody else may have started a can of law blog. So if you're looking five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years down the road, and you want to be the firm that owns this space that wants to say, Hey, we're, you know, we're, we're, guiding in this space or we're, we're the lawyers who know theoretically something that could change the world of medicine a little bit. I think it's going to be interesting to see. It seems really far out there. I know there isn't probably going to be an AMLO 100 or 200 firm that wants to jump immediately on being the, the psychedelics law firm, but I really think we're going to see a, a lot of growth in this. Um, there are so many issues that, that I could say. You could start a couple other ideas would be an NFT law blog, you could start a blog specifically on vaccination that covers the employment law aspects. And also potentially, I think with the discoveries that we've seen in mRNA, uh, you're starting to see them apply a lot of those to other vaccines as well. So the work that we did on COVID vaccines, I think is going to spread out to other things as well. One thing, though, I really would like to see more of, um, some of our clients may not want to see more of this, is any plaintiff's law blog done the right way. Uh, what's the right way? Take a look at Mar Bill Marler. He's a food safety lawyer, marlerblog.com. And then also one of my favorites, we've talked about this numerous times, Cruise Law News from Jim Walker is just outstanding. Uh, both of these folks, they're not throwing up a bunch of content and saying, call me. 
No, they're rising above the fray and they serve as watchdogs for their industry. They choose a very narrow niche and say, I am going to be a watchdog over this. Uh, and that is a great, great story to tell. Like you can beat your chest about that story and say, hey, I'm out here fighting for everyday people. I'm out here making sure, you know, food companies don't poison people. I'm out here saying, I can't believe that they are just filling people up in cruise ships and just having them ravaged with coronavirus. Uh, it's a really great opportunity to rise above the fray and serve as a watchdog. Uh, so if there's anybody that's thinking about that, reach out to us. We can provide some guidance and strategy around that because I don't know. I just really feels like the plaintiff's law space, the personal injury space, uh, much of the blogging that's going on in that world is not great. And it can't be anything that's helping to improve the reputation of those individual lawyers or lawyers as a whole. So man, but still the people who do it well, these, I mean, these are lawyers that get more traffic on our community than anybody. Uh, Jim Walker has a Facebook page with like a hundred thousand likes, which beats probably some, you know, mid-level professional sports teams. And it's just on cruise law. It's, it's insane. But those are some of the ideas that we have, but still, when you're thinking about it, think about what you're looking for. High growth, focused, legal issues from a variety of angles, not just, hey, we got this practice group. Uh, so we're winding down just a couple more things that we want to share. Hey, what are we working on at LexBlog here in 2022? Uh, we got a few things. Michelle, lead us off with one thing we're pretty excited about. Our product team's working on it right now. Yes, so the block editor. You may have heard about this a little bit already. As you can see the screenshot, um, we've written about it on our company's blog, 99 Park Row, just kind of introducing this big change. Change can be a scary thing, but we promise that this change is for the better. But yeah, we look to roll it out completely to every client on the Lexblog platform this year. So we've definitely, you know, taken the thought into it of like, okay, again, as I said, change is scary, but change needs to happen for certain reasons. And this one has been well thought out. It's only for the better. It's for sure going to result, those of you that are clients of us, in a much more clean and elegant interface. And I think like the biggest thing you'll notice is it will look a lot more similar to the front end of a blog post versus what you might see now. Uh, no work is gonna be required on our customer's end. And we'll have some training and resources coming out very soon to just smooth out this transition, make it as easy as possible. But it should be really exciting as it's going to offer a much more user-friendly writing experience. It will result in some pretty clean and nice looking blog posts because as an author, you're going to have more control over the blocks you use. It's called the block editor and how everything appears for my personal blog that I have on the Lexblog platform, it's currently on the block editor. And while it was like maybe a slight adjustment at first from going to like editing things on Lexblog's back end, I can definitely say just personally, it's a much more, yeah, nice experience. It's really easy to customize things in terms of like the different blocks you use. And yeah, we're really excited about that. But yeah, the biggest thing, you don't have to worry about tech compatibility. If you have any issues with it, we can always like set up a personal training with Lexbog, but we'll definitely have some video and written resources for you as well. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I think you're going to like it. Mm -hmm. It's a much cleaner experience. It feels like well, it feels like blogging in 2022. We, it's the latest and greatest from WordPress. We think it's going to help us take all of our, our publications and take a nice step forward. Um, speaking of where you might have seen Kevin O'Keefe, our CEO, push this out there, the Open Legal Blog Archive. We're looking to preserve, index all the credible law blogs out there. If you're in LexBlog, you're already in the Open Legal Blog Archive and are good. Really a focus on search and research, making it so people can discover pieces of content, find authors, find cases, find that type of stuff. But think Internet Archive, but for specifically legal blogs. Uh, really looking to put together kind of a the definitive database of all credible legal blogs. Um, you've seen us put this, some of the firms work with us work with us on these already, which are our portals. Uh, help bring together all blog content into one place, but still have that that unique place, your home base for your blog, so you can say, "Hey, I'm the author of, in this case, the healthcare investor," but the content still appears on a, a portal page where you can kind of see what the firm is putting out as a whole. We've already seen great adoption from law schools, bar associations, and firms. We work with the Wisconsin Bar. We work with CEB out of California. We're really excited to work with law schools like with George Law School uh, in Sacramento. Uh, you can see we work with firms like McGuire Woods, uh, Fair Fritz. Uh, these have been really great, and firms have loved using these 
like we mentioned, it brings all the blog content into one place. You can also offer unique content in them. And now we're kind of looking at how do we make these even more robust media centers, particularly as you know, we mentioned some of the things that lawyers and firms are looking to be better at in 2022. You have video, podcasts, other places where you can get some microblogging in there. Like if you have a quick update, how do we display that on there versus um, a full blog post? But yeah, that's something that we're taking a look at. And then lastly, closing it down the last few seconds, how do, we, how do we have your blog content able to move around a little bit better? We want more agile, more movable content. How can we display content wherever it needs to be? Microsites, websites, et cetera. Um, so if, hey, somebody publishes over on their Lex blog blog, but we want the website to pull it into a certain place where you want to make sure that it's incorporated in your CRM just the right way, uh, or your CMS, not CRM, CMS. We want to incorporate in your CMS or your CRM. We want to be able to start exploring uh, a LexBlog API so you can call on certain pieces of content, make calls for certain pieces of data, and integrate blog content everywhere that it needs to be. And whew, that was it. We are 11 seconds over on everything that we wanted to cover. Is there anything in here that anybody had any questions on? I'll leave it open for a, a second here and make sure that I'm keeping an eye on the chat. but. That was everything that we wanted to cover today as I lose my mouse, but does anybody have any questions? Anything that they want us to answer? If you don't have them now, you can always follow up with us, uh, whether that's personally via email or anything like that. Um, but yeah, uh, it says, are you, Nancy, are you embedding these media centers on the firm's existing website? Uh, right now they run separately as they exist, but you could potentially set it up in such a way that it exists, for example, on a subdomain. Uh, and carries much of the same branding that the firm website would have. So it's not necessarily embedded directly within the website, but um, uh, definitely want to uh, make sure that it's aligned with the website. And that's where we start getting into like the API call. So it's very integrated, but a lot of it is, hey, we want to be able to still set aside the publishing to a certain extent, but have the same branding. You could do that on a, 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 a you could do that with like a subdomain or something like that. Uh, Julie, love that question. I will send over uh, a piece that I've written on the plaintiff's law side. I just, you got a great story to tell. I mean, we need, the world needs more Atticus Finches. Um, I, I, that's, it's redundant. I think that's, you know, it's, 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 I don't know, it's it, not to trivialize it, but man, people who have a great story to tell, Jim Walker, Bill Marler, I'll send over some stuff on that. So you can take a look at not just what I've written up, but some great conversations that we've had with the both of them as well uh, on our podcast that are really, really, really good. Um, absolutely, Nancy, I'd be all for that. But yeah, the world, I just think the world needs more credible and great plaintiff's law lawyers. I think right now, as we've started to look to build out uh, the open legal blog archive, we'll get applications from plaintiff side, personal injury firms, and the content, we just have to turn it away because it's, Hey, you know, this family of four was in a fatal car accident where two people died. If you need somebody, you know, if you, if you have been in an accident, please call us. It's like, no, we're not, we're not putting that in here. No, absolutely not. Um, so yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity for people to get involved in those spaces. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll have another webinar next week. Like I mentioned, I owe somebody an email. Otherwise I would have their name here. I don't want to overpromise, but we should have a very special guest next month. I'm excited to have join us. Uh, but stay tuned. Keep an eye out for the recap on 99parkrow.com. Subscribe to This Week in Legal Blogging to hear directly from lawyers like yourselves on how bloggings work for them and what they're working on. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. We, we really appreciate it. Michelle, anything else to add? No, I think you hit it all. But yeah, thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> thank you so much. All this recording will be up there soon and uh, we'll hope to catch up with you all soon. Thanks so much. Stop.